Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God's peace and comfort is good news to the suffering. Healing, it is for the brokenhearted freedom for all of those who are held bound by one thing or another. Isaiah's message is a message for every age, but it is also a message that brings up questions for the faithful in those ages. And today is the same. We might ask as we listen to this prophecy of, of peace and comfort and good news, why does God just not end human suffering? Why does God not end sinfulness? Why doesn't God end racism, uh, bitter political infighting? Why does God not end poverty? Or war, or the divisions that are brought about by this terrible illness, COVID-19. As I look out there, I look towards Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, and I'm going to lean on him a little bit here. He suggests that such questions teach us God is patient, and that God has created and intends free human beings who through experience come to see their own part in the brokenness, evil, and sin of this world. He continues that the God of history faithfully, patiently hopes that we learn the lessons of history and most of all, our part in it. Sachs turns to the Babylonian captivity the setting of our passage from Isaiah turns to the slavery in Egypt as examples of human oppression of other humans and the interminable time that it takes for human beings to learn. We are reminded, you see, in this slavery uh, that this is not God's will, but human sin. So too for our time. Meanwhile, God works for freedom and the changing of the minds of those involved and in these narratives, the captors and masters. All the while, God reminds us that slavery, Rabbi Sachs says, Sachs says is, is an offense to dignity and part of the continuation of human sibling rivalry. This is, this is true. The early gospelers heard this passage from Isaiah as eschatological imagination, in time imagination, scholar Richard Hayes calls it. This is a shift to offer hope and comfort in a time yet to come when God will make all things right. The eschatological imagination offers a window of justice making prophecy that suggests hope in the midst of every kind of bondage and oppression. Perhaps it's this eschatological imagination that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. drew upon when on the steps in Washington, D.C., addressing a throng of people in 1968, he said, we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. The Gospel of Luke takes the eschatological imagination and locates it, you see, in the work of Jesus. He is not just the bringer of the Gospel, but the embodiment of the Gospel of a living word. This is the gift of the Spirit that sets upon Jesus. And moreover, like Luke suggests in his Gospel, that Jesus' announcement is a kind of Sabbath time reordered, uh, a, a time for the poor and the oppressed. Again, Richard Hayes points out, these are not mere words placed in Jesus' mouth, lifted from Isaiah, but they are the lived narrative of Jesus. 
the gift of reading scripture with the Jewish rabbinical teaching in the one hand and the gospels in the other is that it keeps us from believing that non-action in times such as these is an option for the Christian. We are invited, you see, in Advent to remember the eschatological imagination of God, the end time imagination of God and the words and the ministry of Jesus who make that real in the moment. And the ultimate desire of God that human hearts be truly changed. The combined revelation teaches us that our own hearts are the first steps in the work of living an incarnational faith, that we are to act for good in these moments of suffering, that we are to bring comfort in these moments of suffering, that we are to bring a good word of love and, and, and mercy from God, that we as Christians are invited by this prophecy to lighten the burdens of others. And here on this fourth Sunday of Advent, I want to end with words by Howard Thurman. He intertwines both, I think, in this passage, intentionally or unintentionally, the Jewish understanding of our text today from Isaiah and the gospel's eschatological in time imagination together uh, to see it as a work of mission. Uh, I'm drawing on a beautiful text, essay that he wrote called The Work of Christmas and, and the book I, uh, I'll recommend to you, The Mood of Christmas and Other Celebrations. He wrote, and I'll end with these final words. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, gone when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flock, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among people, and to make music in the heart. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.